see you guys. Uh, I'm Jonathan Hassel. Uh, I used to be Head of Usability and Accessibility uh, for the BBC. Uh, I left there six weeks ago to start Hassel Inclusion, which is my new business. Uh, I'm also uh, Chair of ICT45, so that's the committee uh, at the BSI that's responsible for the new standard uh, BS8878. Um, so, why is that of any interest to you? Well, um, I wanted to start by talking about, if you like, what us on the committee and Leone and various people uh, um, uh, were involved in this uh, think accessibility really is and should be about. So um, it's all about disabled people. Um, that might kind of like go without saying, but for a lot of people, for a long time, it was also about sort of like search engine optimization making things work on all sorts of different platforms. Um, those things are good, but for us, this is the main thing. Um, and actually, we don't kind of like the word accessibility very much. Um, we much prefer words like usability uh, and user experience. Um, fundamentally, it's about whether or not people can get the right experience, the one you are aiming for them to get out of your products. And because um, that is what you try and do for all of your other audiences. So why should it be any different from for disabled and, uh, and older people? Because, and here's the business case, you don't really want to include 10 million plus people from your products, do you? Well, um, lots of people do. Um, so why don't more organisations do it? That was, if you like, the, uh, the, the thing that we wanted to look at. So how does 8878 help? Um, well, the first thing is it presents the business case behind all of this. Um, there's a number of cases for, for why you would do this. Um, people like uh, the legal case, uh, but no one's really been sued. People love the ethical case. Uh, but actually, in a time of, of uh, shrinking revenues, that doesn't really work either. Um, the case that does work is, actually, if you do this, you can make more money. That works. Um, gives advice about how to embed uh, accessibility strategically within an organisation. Shows the process, uh, which identifies the key decisions that are taken uh, in a web product's life cycle, which impact accessibility. Uh, it recommends an informed way of making decisions um, and a way of documenting those decisions so that you can, uh, if you like, claim compliance with the standard. So, the thing uh, the, the, where we start is that you're all kind of like UX people uh, in some form or other, I'm guessing. Um, but accessibility is not just you, it's actually everybody, really. Um, so here you've got your developers, your designers, your writers, your kind of user research, testers, all sorts of people. Yes, uh, all of those people have, have uh, a big impact on accessibility, uh, as do, hopefully. Um, uh, the project managers and product managers, put simply, these people can squash these people. Um, you don't have time to do that, you don't have budget to do that, uh, pretty much like that. Uh, you then have finance, legal, uh, marketing, the strategic people uh, who tell these people that actually, strategically, it's not important to do what you want. And then right at the top, you have a senior manager who might look like this. Um, <laughs> well, hopefully he doesn't look like this or act like this, but um, some do. Um, so, if you are trying to get this embedded into your organisation, you need to make sure that you can motivate all of these people. That's hard, because there's a lot of people there. They do all sorts of different jobs. Or the other way is you motivate this guy at the top and uh, you make a business case which is brilliant and convert him and then it just filters down with everyone else. Basically, um, what I put out there, what would really help uh, accessibility, convert the CEOs. Simple as that. Uh, if you can be in a place where um, actually you're being told that this is a good idea from the top, things are so much easier. Um, also embedding responsibility, work out whose responsibility it is um, to do this. Uh, okay, maybe it's that guy at the top, he's the one who's going to get sued uh, if it doesn't work very well. Um, but they obviously don't do the work, they never do, they delegate it down, so you've got to make sure that they delegate well and monitor what's happening. Uh, and also make sure that the people they delegate to actually are trained to, if you like, fulfil the responsibility uh, that, they're, that they're being uh, given. Um, and then you've got the policies in your organisation that either enable or uh, sort of, you know, get in the way of this sort of stuff. A uh, perfect example would be uh, marketing guidelines. Uh, yes, the logo has to be that colour. Well, actually, lots of people can't see it. 
No, but you see, the logo has to be that colour. We've spent a lot of money on that. So it's that sort of thing. Do your policies actually facilitate accessibility or not? Uh, fundamentally, as people who I'm hoping uh, are going to want to do this, uh, these things are either going to be your best friends or your worst nightmare. So, um, we also wanted to harmonise accessibility with what actually happens in user centres and inclusive design um, for non-digital products. Uh, if you like, accessibility um, was very much around these book hack things. So it was all about um, tick lists. You've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. Pretty much mostly about HTML and sort of like what colours and all those sorts of things. Um, what's that got to do with user centre design? Well, it's a bit of a, a, bit of a sort of uh, move between those. Um, so all of the people out there who are doing great stuff here, I've got that here, are on inclusive design, um, say for instance you create fridges and you also create websites for fridges. If you really cared about inclusive design, you would do completely two different things that didn't have a, a, a you know, link at all. Um, so we wanted to bridge that divide. But the other thing is that in the digital world we can do things you can't do uh, with non-digital products. It's a bit difficult to customise a kettle. Uh, you can, um, but, it's, uh, but it's certainly not something you can turn on and off very, very easily. But in terms of sort of, you know, personalised approaches, uh, all of those sorts of things, there's more you can do in the digital space. Uh, so we wanted to bring that in as well. Uh, so, it's a process, and yes, sorry, there are 16 steps. Uh, the good news is that you're probably doing a lot of them already, so don't worry. Um, uh, but before we kind of like dive into the steps, and I'm not going to go through every one, I've only got four minutes left. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we wanted to look at an informed way of making good decisions. Now this is the point where you kind of like think I'm teaching you to suck eggs. But this is the thing that sometimes just gets missed. Um, so every decision that you make uh, could potentially have an impact on accessibility every single day that you do it. So it's a good idea to make sure that when you look at those decisions you're making them well. So the first thing to do is to make sure that every decision is recognised as a decision. You are making a decision when you decide to do this or decide to do that. Um, and uh, it just happens so, so just naturally that you kind of don't even think that maybe there are some other options. Uh, and actually, there are implications to that decision. And it would be a good idea, maybe, to think about what those options are, what those implications are, and whether you should uh, be making a decision in one way or the other. Because what you need to do, and this is the closest we get to the legal stuff, is you need to come up with something which is based on justifiable reasoning. So we're not saying, you must do this. We are saying, I don't know, can you justify if you're doing it or not doing it? Does it work for the sort of situation you're in? We want you to write it down, um, because when you write it down, you can actually trace it afterwards. Was that a good decision or not? Um, did it come back to haunt us or not? There are loads of examples I can give you of coming back to haunt you um, for every step of the process. So very quickly, uh, and this is just a little bit of a, uh, of, of, uh, of a uh, sort of rush through, uh, picking out some of the ideas. The first point, and you're all going to love this. Just do loads of user research um, and work out what it is you're doing before you even start. So there are six steps here that's to do with process, uh, sort of purpose, audience needs, all of these sorts of things. I want to linger on this one. Target audiences. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, is your site like one of these? Google or the BBC homepage. It's going to be used by everybody. Or actually, is your site for sort of surface? Um, maybe you can't do everything for everybody, so know your target audiences, so you can target the people that really matter. Um, how often do you hear that um, by people talking about accessibility? <coughs> uh, we'll move on. Um, there may be some assumptions you're making that are wrong. Uh, so, assumption number one, all disabled people have an assistive technology that's going to help them use your website. No, they don't. Um, they may have all sorts of restrictions. So you're trying to make a site that, that works for blind children. Uh, they've got bound to have a screen reader, haven't they? No. <laughs> Most of them can't actually uh, either afford one or understand how to get it to working. So that isn't actually going to help you. Make sure your assumptions are right. User research the way to get there. Um, so just a rush through from there, making strategic uh, choices based on that research, because if you've got the research, you're making good choices rather than bad ones. Um, so, how good do you want it to be? 
Um, say for instance, I have a website that is all about um, how often my uh, rubbish gets picked up. I probably want something which is usable. I want to find that information uh, uh, and it's there. It's not really ever going to be satisfying and enjoyable. I'm just not into that. Um, but if I'm doing Pac-Man, if that is not enjoyable, what on earth is the point? The purpose of your product finds how important this sort of stuff is. Something else. Um, this is 2011, uh, and it ain't just the web anymore, thank you, yes. Um, so, uh, making sure that you handle the whole sorts of thing about how do we do accessibility on the platform that I'm creating this for. That's hard, we're trying uh, to help. Um, uh, getting it into production and getting it ready to launch. Uh, there's lots I could say here, there are kind of web guidelines at the top there, but really what we're about is assuring the accessibility through production. There's various different ways that you can test it. Um, some of them cost lots, some of them cost nothing. The benefits are similarly uh, are there. Uh, hopefully uh, we can push this out through organisations that will do more of it. Um, and also, know that you can't do everything perfect the first time. Minimal viable products. People know about those? iPhone, when it launched, didn't have cut and paste. How the hell did that happen? <laughs> uh, because it wasn't needed for the version 1 product. Sometimes you can't get it into the version 1 product. The version 1 product just needs to get out there. So, we need to make sure um, that... Uh, this is pretty much the last... I'm going to summarise. Um, uh, if you are making those compromises, tell your audiences. So, very quickly, in a summary, uh, if you're in an organisation that is following this sort of stuff, you will be expected to take accessibility seriously by the product managers who are, uh, you're working with. You'll be in a team where each member of the team actually understands what accessibility expects from them. They'll ask you to follow user design process, and that's pretty much what you want anyway, I'm guessing. Um, they'll ask you for, or actually give you, real-world um, user research to help your decision-making. You'll be empowered to make decisions about accessibility as long as you can justify them and write down why. You'll have the freedom to create product variations uh, where users' needs may diverge. You'll have a place to find best practice help for accessibility beyond the web. Uh, you'll be asked to test products for accessibility, pulling it in with usability to the level the budget will allow and people won't ask you to do stupid things with almost no money. And you'll be free from the possibility of doing everything perfect first time. Um, but you'll need to tell the audience why and justify it. Um, if you want more, that's me. I'm Hassan Inclusion. This is the sort of stuff I do. Thank you very much.